Hey everybody, it's Cheryl Lawson. Welcome to Live FAQ. I'm back with Mary Shaman today because we had so many questions and follow-up questions after our last uh, thyroid hangout. So uh, as you know, Mary is a thyroid and hormone patient advocate and the author of tons of books on the subject. So uh, welcome back, Mary. Thanks, Cheryl. Glad to be here. <laughs> so we're going to just run through a few of the questions, the follow-up questions we received um, the other day. Can I get you to turn your volume down just a tad? Sure. Okay. And then I'll turn mine down. There we go. Good. All right. So um, the first question, or the new question, is how does menopause affect hypothyroidism? Sure. Well, the question about menopause and thyroid issues is a really interesting one. And one of the first things that people need to know is that the onset of menopause, which typically occurs in our late 30s, early 40s, the perimenopausal period, is a time when thyroid disease does become more of a risk. So there are some estimates that say by the time a woman is 60, she has a two in five chance of having some form of thyroid dysfunction. And most often that would be hypothyroidism. So uh, one of the things that we do know is that a lot of women start to get into their 40s, they gain weight, they're tired, they feel depressed, their uh, periods become erratic, they may feel uh, brain foggy, their memory starts to go, and the immediate assumption in a woman in her 40s or early 50s is it must be menopause or perimenopause. But actually, there are some studies that have shown that a substantial number of the women with those uh, constellation of symptoms are actually experiencing thyroid symptoms, but they're not diagnosed. So one of the things that I always urge women in their late 30s to their 50s who are experiencing these kinds of symptoms and who automatically assume it's menopause or whose doctors say, hey, honey, you're getting to that age, you know, it must be menopause, that they really want to get a good thyroid check. And that would include a TSH, a free T4, a free T3, and probably also a thyroid antibodies panel to get a picture as to whether they've got autoimmune thyroid disease because then we can be working with a little bit more information. We know that most women from the age of 39 onward will have fluctuations in uh, sex hormones that lead eventually to the menopausal transition. But what we don't always know is that there are many women in that age group who have thyroid issues that are not being picked up on and diagnosed. And you can take hormone replacement therapy till the cows come home and it's not going to address these symptoms if the underlying problem is a thyroid issue. And in fact, I know a number of doctors that have said, look, one of the things I, I do right away in a woman who's not responding to an estrogen or a bioidentical hormone therapy is run a complete thyroid panel because it's probably her thyroid that's causing the symptoms and not necessarily the sex hormone imbalance. So that's really, I think, the crux of the issue for women that are in menopausal or perimenopausal age range to know that they are at a higher risk of thyroid issues. One other thing to add, though, is that for people who have a thyroid problem already, menopause can be a bit of a roller coaster. So I always tell people, fasten your seatbelts, girls, because it's going to get a little bumpy. Because what happens is once we're in, uh, starting into the menopausal train, that can destabilize our thyroid situation as well. So it becomes a time when we want to be monitoring our thyroid more carefully, and the thyroid dosage may need adjustment either up or down, depending on the effects that the changes in estrogen and progesterone are having in our body. So it's a time to be aware that both thyroid and sex hormones that are changing in perimenopause and menopause, we need to be aware that those they can impact each other and we want to pay much closer attention to those tests and the levels and the symptoms that we're having so that we can ferret out which one is um, a menopausal problem, which one is a thyroid problem. Right, and I promise you that was not my uh, a, a question submitted by me. <laughs> okay, you're too although, young. Although I just got some really good information, <laughs> so that leads me to uh, this. Does sound like a whole list of questions by me, but do autoimmune problems run in families? 
autoimmune problems can run in families. There is an autoimmune tendency that can be passed along genetically from family member to, uh, to their offspring. One of the things though, that a lot of people don't understand is that the, the thing that is genetically passed along is a tendency towards developing any one of the 80 to 100 diseases that are categorized as autoimmune. So if you have a mother or a father or a grandparent who had any one of the many autoimmune diseases, such multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, Graves' disease, psoriasis, um, lupus, then you are at a slightly increased risk yourself of developing any one of these different autoimmune diseases. So it's not necessarily that a lupus patient passes along a higher risk for lupus or a Graves' disease patient passes along a higher risk for Graves' disease, but rather the tendency towards autoimmunity is what's passed along through the genetic markers. Got it. That's great. That's great information. So um, the next question is, is an underactive thyroid associated with low testosterone levels in men age around 47? Okay. Well, this is, this is really a lot like the issue of women in perimenopause. Uh, and some uh, physicians have actually labeled the period of when men hit their late 40s into their 50s andropause because it's a time when they often experience a drop in their testosterone levels that can affect their, uh, their ability to uh, build muscle. Some of the men find that they are gaining belly fat or they're not being able to build muscle. Their strength drops. Sex drive can be affected as well. Uh, so there, it's also a time when men start to get that increased risk for thyroid issues as well. Because when we're talking about the endocrine system, we're talking about the sex hormone balance, the thyroid balance, and the adrenal balance. So anytime any one of these factors gets out of balance, it can start to destabilize the other factors as well. So men in their 40s being at a little bit higher risk of developing a thyroid issue may find that one of the first signs of an endocrine imbalance would be a drop in their testosterone levels. It's also possible, however, for some men who have an underactive thyroid and may be undiagnosed to also experience drops in their testosterone levels. And this can result because the adrenals start to have to work harder because the thyroid is not functioning properly and the adrenals are building on the same building blocks for ingredients that the sex hormones are. And the body considers survival more important than reproduction. So it will channel its hormone production into the uh, adrenals rather than the sex hormones to try to keep us up and running. But that can often leave people mildly or even substantially deficient in sex hormones. So there's a, an interrelationship between all of these. So yes, there definitely can be a connection between low testosterone and hypothyroidism in a man in his 40s and beyond. Wow, that's great information. So the next question... Uh, again, could have uh, come from me. It says, I can't lose any weight and I eat healthy and exercise five times a, a, a week. What type of diet should I be on? Well, this is, this is a really broad question right. um, because it really depends so much on this person's particular physiology. I mean, we don't know if this, if a person asking this kind of question has a uh, problem with uh, blood sugar or uh, insulin resistance or leptin resistance or if they simply are an undiagnosed thyroid patient who hasn't been properly diagnosed and treated. But typically, I mean, one of the things that I always tell people and uh, in my book, The Thyroid Diet Revolution, I walk through these steps with folks to take them from A to Z through this entire process. But one of the first things we want to do with someone who is finding that they cannot lose weight despite a good diet and exercise is a comprehensive thyroid panel. That would be TSH, free T4, free T3, uh, also the thyroid antibodies. In people who are having a tough time losing weight, the reverse T3 test is also useful. Uh, also recommend that people would look at a leptin test to test to see if this particular hormone, which helps us either burn fat or become very good at storing fat, is out of balance. And that sort of constellation of tests can give us a good starting point. Also, fasting glucose 
and in some cases hemoglobin A1C can give us a good picture of whether there are irregularities in the blood sugar. So that really would be sort of a comprehensive starting point for someone to get at least a sense whether there were physiological issues that were preventing them from being able to lose weight. Now there are people who have no uh, physiological issues but they're eating well and exercising and they still can't lose weight and in some cases what we see there is that there is excessive stress in their life which is creating a barrier to, to weight loss because extremely high stress levels can create cortisol which then makes you very effective at storing fat and even ultra um, marathoners or high intensity exercisers can sometimes be doing themselves uh, a world of hurt because they're creating such high stress hormone levels that it counteracts the weight loss effects of the exercise and diet. Uh, we also see a lot of people that are carrying extra weight because of gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. So in some cases I've talked with a number of people who simply cut gluten out of their diet, didn't change the uh, calorie intake, didn't change their exercise and lost 25 pounds in a month. So there are a number of different factors. Now gluten sensitivity and celiac disease can be evaluated uh, at least to starting point using the anti-gliadin antibodies test. So that's a panel that can be helpful to some people to get a sense of whether there is a, a wheat or gluten sensitivity or even uh, the possibility of celiac disease. In people who have high blood sugar or high uh, hemoglobin A1C, that tells us that they probably are going to need to really control their uh, carbohydrate intake and focus on uh, some of the diets that are more like the paleo style diets or uh, you know high in healthy protein, good fats, good vegetables but low in uh, simple carbohydrates, processed foods, that type of thing. So I don't think there's any one magic bullet answer for all of this but I can tell you I mean I've just lost about uh, 10 pounds in the last two months by cutting back dramatically the amount of gluten in my diet. And I have been tested and I am not uh, testing positive for gluten sensitivity, but yet simply removing the gluten from my diet, I was able to drop uh, a very stubborn uh, last, you know, eight to 10 pounds that I was really trying to get rid of. So um, I think, you know, the key is trial and error you, and having some good information and data as far as what's going on with your body physiologically. And I will say personally, there are tons of gluten-free uh, alternatives to your favorite foods. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and you can even cook uh, with gluten-free flour and right. and different uh, stuff. So you know, to, I, I, I'm a I'm a, a, a testifier of the gluten-free. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the next question is: Could other medical conditions such as Obstruction, ob obstructive or central sleep apnea cause hypothyroidism? Well, this is an interesting question, but it's a little bit backwards because the, it, it, the opposite is true. If you have hypothyroidism and it is not treated or not properly treated, it puts you at a much higher risk of having obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea. Ah. Uh, so sleep apnea, in fact a good uh, sleep specialist or sleep study when they detect that you have apnea one of the first things they should be doing is a comprehensive thyroid panel. Uh, a lot of ENTs are not doing this, a lot of sleep uh, labs are not doing this, but apnea can be a symptom of hypothyroidism and so it's one of the first steps. It's not the reason for everyone. I mean there are certainly people who have apnea because they're obese or because they have malformations in their uh, their uh, throat area or blockages or they have sinus problems or other issues like that or they are you know sleeping on their back in improper positions there's a lot of reasons for apnea but hypothyroidism can be one of them so it's worth it's worth it for people who are struggling with apnea to have a comprehensive thyroid evaluation and to understand what those results mean because even mild or subclinical hypothyroidism can contribute to a risk of apnea or worsen an existing case of apnea. Wow. Okay, so um, Mary has mentioned several tests uh, already, and um, I'll, I'll list the link to uh, where you can go and either order those tests or take a look at them. Uh, you can also go to livefaq.com and select the thyroid tab, and you'll be able to um, order your test, and I'll also put the link in 
the discussion part of this video. So uh, look below. Okay, so the next question is, um, what other health issues can an underactive thyroid cause? Okay, do you have about five hours? <laughs> because an underactive thyroid can cause a number of other health issues, but I'll sort of give you the overview. It can uh, contribute to uh, elevated cholesterol and elevated uh, triglycerides and blood fats. It can, uh, untreated or undertreated hypothyroidism can contribute to an increased risk of heart disease in general. Uh, hyperthyroidism, the opposite problem, can uh, contribute to or cause atrial fibrillation, uh, which is a, a very dangerous heart condition. Uh, thyroid disease in general, when it's not properly treated, and particularly the hypothyroid end of things, can contribute to a risk of obesity or weight gain, which of course we know is a, is a root cause of a lot of other issues as well. Uh, hypothyroidism and autoimmune thyroid disease can contribute to um, the risk of miscarriage and can contribute to infertility as well. Uh, there's definitely a connection between depression and thyroid disease and in fact if you're uh, going to be prescribed an antidepressant a lot of patients don't realize that on the prescribing instructions that the doctor has it says that a doctor should rule out a thyroid disorder before they prescribe an antidepressant. Very few of them do this and in fact they're handing out uh, prescriptions for antidepressants like candy and without ever checking thyroid levels but it is actually part of the prescribing instructions that before they hand out an antidepressant and before they hand out an anti-cholesterol medication like a statin drug, they should be, be doing a comprehensive thyroid evaluation. Wow. And that is not really being done out there. Uh, the uh, imbalances in the thyroid can also contribute to worsening of PMS symptoms in some women. It can contribute to a whole variety of menstrual disorders. Uh, heavy menstrual periods, light menstrual periods, very painful periods, all of the different categories, missing periods completely, all of these types of menstrual disorders can be linked to uh, thyroid irregularities as well. Um, thyroid problems are also linked to carpal tunnel and tarsal tunnel and tendinitis. Uh, there's a linkage between thyroid problems and frozen shoulder. And so these are just a few. I mean, again, I could go on for hours about all of the different things. But when you think about the fact that the thyroid is the master gland of energy and metabolism, and it delivers oxygen and energy to every single cell in the body and every organ and every tissue. So everything that we do, from the brain down to the toes, relies on this. So some people will have hair loss as a result of their thyroid problem. Uh, some people will have uh, a skin disorders as a result of their thyroid problem, very dry skin or a su supremely dry eyes that, are become, that get to the point where it becomes uh, debilitating. Uh, other people have heart palpitations, um, you know, the fertility issues that I've mentioned, digestive problems, constipation, one of the, one of the most serious thyroid uh, symptoms that no one ever wants to talk about. Right. So there are a number of issues that are all connected and uh, but you know if you think about almost any condition the thyroid can contribute to it or in some cases can be a cause uh, of that problem when we're dealing with uh, it not being properly diagnosed or treated. That's amazing and um, you know I, I, what I think is really interesting is that some of the things that you just said were you know, this is you, you. Doctors should be checking the thyroid first uh, before you, uh, you know, look at something else. The thyroid should be uh, checked first, and and it's pretty easy to to check the thyroid to see if there's a problem first, is it not? <laughs> well, it's easy, but it's not always um, uh, as easy for them to understand what to do with the results, uh -huh. and that's the challenge. And we also have a challenge, um, which we've talked about uh, in a previous. Uh, presentations where you know the, the a lot of the doctors are relying solely on the TSH test right. and when you rely only on this one test you're not going to be able to get a complete picture of what's really going on with the thyroid so some people might even be getting a TSH test before they're put on an antidepressant or a statin drug or before they go for fertility treatments but if someone's not looking at the free T4, the free T3, the antibodies to see what's really going on they're not really going to have a complete picture. 
That's fantastic. Um, okay, so the next question is, how much iodine do you recommend consuming? Okay. Iodine is a really controversial topic for thyroid patients because we have a camp of doctors out there whose, whose knee-jerk reaction to the hearing the word thyroid is to hand you a bottle of iodine and say, here, take some iodine. It's also uh, the, the sort of treatment du jour for everybody that works at a health food store and including the 17-year-old kid behind the counter at your at your Whole Foods and, and such, everybody thinks thyroid immediately means iodine. And the rationale for that is that iodine in the diet is the building block for thyroid hormone. So understandably, if you are very deficient in iodine, you don't have enough building blocks to make thyroid hormone, which can make you hypothyroid. Now the extreme version of this is what we see in some developing and uh, third world countries where there is severe iodine deficiency because they don't have fortified bread and they don't have iodized salt. And you have mothers that are profoundly hypothyroid and they are then turning around and giving birth to babies who are profoundly iodine deficient and, thi and, and deficient in thyroid hormone. And these babies are born with mental retardation and a condition known as cretinism. So it, interestingly, iodine deficiency is one of the leading uh, preventable causes of mental retardation in the world. But here in the United States, uh, and in many of the industrialized countries or countries that have iodized salt programs, we don't have that level of iodine deficiency. But people have been going away from iodized salt, people are going away from processed foods that contain iodized salt or um, iodinated uh, other types of uh, additives and people are also just going on lower salt diets and or replacing uh, you know their 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 container of salt with sea salt which doesn't contain natural iodine in it and so we're starting to see an increase in iodine deficiencies returning back in the United States but some estimates suggest that maybe 20 percent of the population has some degree of iodine deficiency now again there are some doctors who believe that everyone with a thyroid problem has an iodine deficiency and needs to be on supplemental iodine. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience I've tried supplemental iodine and it just has not worked well for me. And I know another, a number of other patients who've had similar experiences. At the same time I've also talked with people who did have mild iodine deficiency who had great success using uh, doses of, of iodine and in particular they use either iodorol which is a combination of iodine or iodide or they use uh, Lugol solution which is a liquid form of iodine and iodide and those are considered to be the optimum ways to take iodine supplementation versus bladder rack or other kinds of iodine that is not the combination of the iodine and the iodide and some of those folks have had really great results with the iodine but I think my general recommendation to people is don't just jump out on the bandwagon and take iodine but get your iodine levels tested and that's something that you can do uh, you can do it through there's a uh, blood test there's also a urinary iodine clearance test so there's several different ways to evaluate your iodine levels and if you are deficient at that point you want to work with a practitioner who knows how to use iodine properly and then you can supplement. But the supplementing with iodine, except for the amount of iodine you might find in a, in a multivitamin, is not a do-it-yourself project. Um, but special uh, note here for pregnant women. Women who are pregnant need a higher al 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 amount of iodine in their diet. And most of the prenatal vitamins have some additional iodine, but you want to make sure that your prenatal vitamin has some additional iodine in it and in fact if you're thinking about getting pregnant it's really important to be iodine replete with meaning you want to have enough iodine in your system before you even get pregnant so a lot of doctors that I know recommend that women start on a prenatal vitamin in the months before they try to conceive uh, because then that allows their body to build up an, uh, enough stored iodine to be able to meet the demands of pregnancy that's great information. So the next question is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a good question. Uh, is hypothyroidism something that will inevitably get worse as time progresses? Well, it depends. It depends on why you're hypothyroid. Uh, some people are hypothyroid because they've had a nodule removed or they've had half of their thyroid removed due to cancer or due to 
uh, an enlarged uh, thyroid known as a goiter. And in that case, if they still have part of a gland that's functioning, they may need to be on some form of thyroid hormone replacement, but it's likely that their existing thyroid gland is probably going to stay fairly stable. And so their hypothyroidism won't necessarily get worse. Um, the kind of hypothyroidism that typically gets worse is what's known as Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, that's actually the disease that causes hypothyroidism in uh, the, the, that's the, the primary cause of hypothyroidism, at least in the United States. And in those cases, Hashimoto's disease, the antibodies are pumped out and pumped out, and over time they tend to attack, degrade, and atrophy the thyroid's ability to function. And it, typically what we see is the hypothyroidism getting slowly and progressively worse in those patients. So it really depends on why you're hypothyroid in the first place, whether it's going to get worse over time. And that's really talking about it from a, the functioning of the gland. Uh, the question may also be, are your symptoms going to get worse over time? Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're not properly treated, your symptoms can get worse. As we get older, again, I mentioned you know, the changes that happen in, in our 40s and 50s with menopause and andropause can destabilize our thyroid treatment and require us to kind of revisit it and, and fine tune it. So, and, and as we get older, the thyroid sometimes will slow down to some extent as well and may need a little extra support. So those are other factors that we want to keep in mind as well. Right. Okay, so the next question, I think we covered it a little bit uh, in, in, in the earlier questions, but um, can menopause trigger hypothyroidism? Well, um, as, as we talked about, really, when you're in perimenopause or menopause, your sex hormone balance is shifting. Your progesterone and estrogen are typically dropping, or they're at least fluctuating up and down. This can have an effect on the adrenals, and it can also have an effect on the thyroid. So whether it's a straight trigger or whether it's more that there are, is an endocrine imbalance that is predisposing you to also then develop hypothyroidism, yeah, we definitely can say that the period of perimenopause and menopause is a risk factor for becoming hypothyroid. Wow. Okay, so this is uh, a question that came in from somebody who's, uh, uh, who's obviously uh, taking some thyroid uh, supplementation. It says, can, can the thyroid ever work on its own again so I can stop taking Armour Thyroid? There are some cases where the thyroid can work again. Uh, for example, some women after pregnancy have a postpartum thyroiditis that leaves them hypothyroid. And some of those women become substantially hypothyroid enough that their doctors will put them on medication. Typically, with a postpartum thyroiditis or postpartum thyroid disease, eventually, after about a year after the baby is born, the thyroid sometimes returns back more to a normal state. And so some of those people will find that they will you know, not need the dose they're on, they'll be able to drop their dose, or they may be able to even go off their medication entirely. In other cases, one, one thing that we know is an absolute cure for a subset of patients who have uh, autoimmune thyroid disease, particularly Hashimoto's, is if their Hashimoto's was triggered by celiac disease. So if you, have a, if you are a celiac patient and you have Hashimoto's antibodies and have become hypothyroid, some of those patients, I'm not saying all of them, but some of those patients, if they go on a strict and rigorous gluten-free diet, several months later, they may notice their antibodies start to drop, and eventually they may go into what would be considered a remission of their autoimmune thyroid disease and be able to go off of thyroid medication entirely and find that their thyroid function returns to normal if they remain on the gluten-free diet and don't create additional inflammatory situations. We also have people that are borderline. They have, may have very mild hypothyroidism and it may be due to an iodine deficiency or it may be due to stress or uh, dietary uh, issues and in those cases if they correct some of those issues then they may find that that nudges them back into the normal range and they feel well, they don't have symptoms and therefore they basically can go off their thyroid medication. Uh, the other issue that we, where we've seen this happen is sometimes people that are over consuming goitrogenic vegetables and foods. So this is the, these are the people that are going soy crazy or they're juicing raw cabbage and raw broccoli and, and having it three times a day. 
these uh, goitrogens in large quantities when overconsumed can actually slow your thyroid down and make you hypothyroid. So in some of those cases, I've heard people say, well, I started to eat a very heavy soy diet and raw juicing, and three months later I was hypothyroid, I had to go on medication, and then they read something you know, at my website or in one of my books, and they discovered that they were doing all the wrong things for their thyroid. They stopped the raw juicing, they got off all the heavy soy, and the next thing they knew their thyroid reverted back to normal and they were able to go off their medication. So there are some circumstances where it's not a lifelong issue. If you've had um, thyroid surgery to remove your glands of, or you have had radioactive iodine ablation, which basically kills the gland, or you've had a long-standing history of Hashimoto's and maybe an ultrasound has confirmed that your gland has atrophied, then it's not likely that you're going to be able to go off thyroid medication uh, because it's, a, it's required for fundamental uh, physiologic processes. We cannot live without thyroid hormone. Eventually, we, it would kill us. Well, and the next question is, why do thyroid problems happen more in women? Well, it's a good question. We don't really know the answer completely. Uh, certainly, we know that autoimmune diseases are much more likely to strike women than men. And thyroid, because Hashimoto's and Graves' disease are two of the most common autoimmune diseases, and they're the most common cause of thyroid problems in the United States, the question then is kind of tied. It, why are more women affected by autoimmunity and by these autoimmune thyroid diseases? And this is a question that a lot of really top-notch researchers are working on. Uh, up at Johns Hopkins, there's a uh, researcher, Dr. Noel Rose, who has been on the forefront of the research into autoimmunity. And some of the theories are that, in particular for women, because our immune system has to be able to accommodate a fetus, which is a foreign body, our immune system has to be able to turn on and turn off. So it has to be able to sort of shut down and accept the baby as a, as a, as a, a not a foreign invader, not like a bacteria or a virus or a tumor or something foreign to the body, but that because this ability in women to turn on and turn off the immune system um, is inherent to our childbearing abilities that something is getting dysfunctional in that switch on switch off process and the body then gets confused and starts to attack things that it's not supposed to like its own glands, organs, cells and tissues so that's kind of the, the very oversimplified version of some of the theory there are so many others there have been a lot of studies into the effects of estrogen on autoimmune diseases and whether they help or hurt or can even be used as treatment and you know it there are symposia and conferences and research going on about this and you know they're making some progress to try to understand it but it's a very complex topic and so we don't really have any definitive answers at this point. Oh, interesting. Okay so the next question is uh, does adrenal disease need to be treated prior to thyroid treatment? Well this is really a a, a controversial question. I mean, because if you go out into the conventional endocrinology world, they don't even acknowledge adrenal disease in the way that we're talking about it here. The conventional endocrinology world says that your adrenals are fine unless you have absolutely no cortisol, in which case you have Addison's disease, or you have way too much cortisol, in which case you have Cushing's disease. They don't acknowledge the idea of adrenal insufficiency or adrenal fatigue. That is a concept that has gained, gained much more traction with the integrative community and who are really leading the knowledge and understanding of adrenals that are not performing where they should be but have not qualified for one of these two extremes uh, of disease that the endocrinologist will recognize. Now among the integrative doctors there's a lot of different philosophies. Some say if we don't treat the adrenals first and get those into balance and supported then throwing thyroid into the mix just can make things worse. And there's some evidence with some patients and anecdotal uh, experience that some patients do find that if their thyroid is out of balance and they go on thyroid medication but their adrenals have not been addressed, they actually will have a, maybe a two or three week honeymoon period and then they crash and they feel worse. Um, at the same time, I also know some physicians who believe in gently supporting all of them 
in a slow ramp up. So they will support the adrenals, but they will also support the thyroid at the same time. The kind of idea, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. Right. So uh, it really depends on what doctor you're talking to, and it probably depends on your uh, the level of adrenal fatigue. Because if somebody is is really profoundly adrenally fatigued, uh, something like stage three, stage four adrenal exhaustion, then it may make sense uh, for them to get the adrenals supported, to get the nutritional changes, to get the lifestyle changes, and all of the other things in place to get the adrenals in good shape before they add thyroid to the mix. So it, it, it's really a, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. It's something that needs to be customized for each patient. Right. So the next question is, is thyroid cancer hereditary? There are some forms of thyroid cancer that are hereditary, and um, there's a particular form of medullary uh, thyroid cancer that's he uh, hereditary, so we do see uh, with some genetic markers that there are family histories that will run through families. So uh, folks that have thyroid cancer want to make sure that they ask their doctor, do I have a type that tends to have a genetic component? And if so, what particular genetic tests and, and such should my family members have just to make sure that, uh, that they're not at a higher risk? Okay. Uh, oh my goodness, we're almost done. So how can two thyroid scans come up with different results for nodules? And then, this is a two-parter, <laughs> what, what, what is one to believe and how do you decide a bi if a biopsy is necessary? Well, this is a really interesting question because we've really got, we've got some new things on the, uh, in the available to patients that really can, can eliminate this, this question completely. Uh, when you have a thyroid nodule, and nodules are very common, and the vast majority of them are benign. I think it's about 90 to 95 percent of thyroid nodules are benign. They're not cancerous. But a small percentage of them are cancerous, so we need to take nodules seriously. So doctors will typically do an ultrasound. They may do an MRI, or they may do a thyroid uptake scan where they give you a small tracer dose of radioactive iodine and then take an x-ray of your thyroid to see what the nodule is doing. Now, a lot of these visual tests can be inconclusive. Uh, you may see that a nodule is what, what's referred to as warm, meaning that it will absorb some of the iodine but not as much as you would expect to see in a hot nodule, a nodule that is essentially functioning thyroid tissue that's just formed into a nodule. A cold nodule won't absorb the iodine at all and will show up as a dark spot on the x-ray and those are more often cancerous. Uh, so sometimes when they look, do these visual or imaging studies, they can get a pretty clear picture that says absolutely this is uh, looks cancerous or this really looks very benign, we're going to just monitor it periodically and see what's going on. Now, what happens is if they are not sure, if they can't really tell, the next step is a fine needle aspiration biopsy where they insert a needle, usually using ultrasound guidance, into the nodule to take a, a sample then, which then is pathologically uh, an analyzed to look for any evidence of cancer. Now, in the past, if that result came back as cancer, then the first step would be to have a thyroidectomy, have a thyroid surgery, and follow up for cancer treatment. Um, but a, uh, there's some estimates that 30 to 40 percent of the fine needle aspiration biopsies come back as inconclusive or indeterminate. And in that case, up until the last two years, the only choice you had if you had an indeterminate or inconclusive fine needle aspiration was to have a full thyroidectomy. They would take your thyroid out. And then they would do the pathology and they would discover that the majority of those people did not have cancer. So they would be left with no thyroid and a lifetime of hypothyroidism. So now there's a new test on the market and I've been a huge supporter of this company because I am so thrilled that it's out there on the market. It's a, com a company called Verisite and they make a test called the Aperma Thyroid Analysis. And this test has almost completely eliminated the inconclusive and indeterminate fine needle aspiration biopsy result. So it can, with the same accuracy as 
uh, the finding the last aspiration, it can give you a conclusive result with very few false negatives or false positives. So most of the patients, going down the road, I think it's going to become the standard of care. Right now, it's not yet, but it's covered by Medicare, and many insurances are starting to cover it because it's much cheaper to do the Affirma process than it is to do a thyroidectomy and have somebody have lifelong hypothyroidism. So I'm, every time I get a chance, I'm letting people know this test is out there because a lot of people's doctors don't know it exists and a lot of patients don't know it exists and you have to make sure they're doing it when you get the biopsy. It's not something you can do after the fact. So you have to have the prep kit for this particular test available at the time they're doing the biopsy in order that for the samples to be able to be processed by Verisite using the Affirma thyroid analysis process. That's, uh, that's great information. So um, the next question it goes, kind of goes back to the adrenal uh, issue is does adrenal problems uh, or do a, adrenal problems often accompany autoimmune thyroid disease? Uh, again, when the different system is out of balance as well, or vice versa. So again, this is one of those issues. If people are uh, have low resistance to disease, a lot of fatigue, uh, if they are uh, finding that they have low resistance to exercise, uh, or they are intolerant of exercise, or they're exhausted all the time, even with optimal thyroid treatment, it's a good idea to get the adrenals checked. And one of the best ways that the integrative world uses to evaluate the adrenals is the 24-hour saliva cortisol test as well as an evaluation of the DHEAS uh, measurement. And that gives us a good picture of the stress hormones and their daily rhythm and what might be happening with the adrenal system. Awesome. Okay. And then uh, the last question is, can someone help me with my results? Yes, I can. <laughs> uh, certainly. Uh, Exactly. Certainly patients who are ordering their tests through my med lab, if they're ordering thyroid panels, they will be presented with an option to add on a 15-minute coaching session with me uh, part of their panel. And what I do is then I look through their test results and I get on the phone with them for 15 minutes and help explain the test results, help them understand what the results mean and uh, what kinds of questions they can ask their doctor, what other resources they may want to look at. So it's kind of fast forwarding them up the learning curve. Hey everybody, uh, we're back and uh, joining us is David Clymer, the CEO of My Med Lab. And uh, Mary and I were just talking about uh, thyroid and what's interesting is the last question and I think we probably got cut off was how can someone help with my results, and it, I think that leads right into uh, this new experience that uh, my med lab and Mary have have uh, collaborated on. And it's I don't know I, I want to call it a mobile app, but I know it's more than just a mobile app. David, you have a better explanation of. Well, I think so. I, you know, I, what a great opportunity to to be part of an exciting announcement. Uh, my med lab has worked with Mary for more than five years. Um, we think she's an amazing source of information, uh, both for the public as well as our own uh, consumers. And uh, I think what we're you know we're here to announce today is we think is a game changer for the for the health consumer. Um, you know, I'm glad to call it an app uh, because I think that's the term most people are familiar with, but it's really much more than that. Um, I would you know we we kind of see it as a digital health experience, and. Uh, you know, if you if you think about it as an expert guiding you uh, through a process to better understanding a specific health topic, in this case thyroid, and then helping you to prepare to uh, to see your own personal doctor. Um, you know, th it's a concept that I like to call pre-care, or it's the time you spend preparing um, to get ready to uh, to make the most of your doctor's visit. On um, the thyroid app itself, you know, is a is a six month collaboration uh, with some of the best and brightest uh, people in healthcare. Uh, starting with uh, you know an amazing new Silicon Valley startup called Step One Health, um, who I'm I'm excited to be able to announce that uh, have, they've signed on to uh, help us create more of these these digital health experiences from uh, for other topics like heart disease, diabetes, uh, hormones and menopause, hepatitis C, and 
And uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, topics, because it's so easy to, to find and so easy to fix, is vitamin D. Yeah. So I, I want to put out a call to all the listeners. Uh, we'd love to get your suggestions on the next topics, uh, so you can share them with me directly at uh, newtopics at mymedlab.com. Um, I can... You know, I can talk about the new experience, but it's it's really uh, something that you uh, that's even better when you can walk through it. Um, you can find the free app uh, that we've uh, created with Mary um, in the iPhone the iPhone App Store and the Android version at Google Play. Um, it's embedded on on Mary's site on our Facebook pages. It's also embedded in all of my MedLab panels that include a, a thyroid test. So uh, awesome! Are you going to show us a little bit of how it works? I am. Ah, awesome. Um, this way we can walk through the process and you can see it directly. Here's the beginning uh, page of it and as we go through, you uh, get started. Here's, here's what it looks like on an iPhone. Simple interface, you basically click the Start Now button. Takes us through, uh, it shows you how to navigate, it's a swipe. Uh, the very first question is male and female. I think Mary says seven, uh, seven to ten times more likely in female than in than in men. Uh, if you if you choose female, you take we take you down a different path than we would if you were a, a male. And uh, the challenge that we that we gave to Mary in, in creating this process is, um, I ask her if you could only have twenty pieces of of information about me. Um, and you were trying to find the clearest picture of what you could find for thyroid dysfunction, what would those 20 pieces of data be? And that's the foundation of what we built, the initial um, uh, quiz for the risk assessment. Um, includes the most common symptoms. Uh, it includes a family history of autoimmune. Uh, it includes um, the different treatments that you've been on. Uh, how many x-rays you've had, uh, cholesterol levels, those kinds of things. takes all that information and from it, it creates a, a unique uh, risk report specifically for you based on how you answer the questions. Um, this is where all the magic happens. The first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to have um, a hard copy to share with, with your doctor. So you click the email, it sends you out an email copy of the entire report, how you answer the questions and your risk assessment. Um, the, the second part is how you can get your numbers. Uh, Mary, Mary is a big advocate on the fact that symptoms are one thing, but blood tests don't lie. That's where you find many of those pieces. So we've created a panel with the four must-have thyroid values for Mary that you can get in your local lab without a, a doctor or an appointment before you see your doctor. The next action item is to actually ask Mary a question. We're really excited about this and what live FAQ can do for us here. Uh, Part of the, the uh, best way is to try to determine the most efficient way to answer your question. And so doing these live FAQ broadcasts with Mary allows us to be able to ask the specific questions. Here we, we ask a question as what is reverse T3? It found match, a matched answer already. So we click the button and when you click the, the answer button, it actually pulls up to the video where Mary is explaining reverse T3. So in, in three minutes, you can, you can hear the entire uh, explanation of Mary from the expert side um, without having to watch an hour-long video and, and hope that she addresses the issue that you're looking for. Um, the next and the one I'm the most excited about is the ability to actually speak with Mary. Um, here it's the four uh, basic tests. You create a thyroid panel and you review it in real time with Mary. I don't think this has ever been possible before. Um, it's the beginning of the concierge medicine model, and it's, it's, it's fundamentally changing the way that you prepare for your doctor. Once you've gone through the process, um, we hope that you'll share it with others. Uh, it, you can share it by email. You can, you can post it on your Facebook wall. You can, you can share it on Twitter and, and Google Plus as well. And so what you're sharing is, hey, um, download this app, right? You're not sharing necessarily. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. You're saying, I, I found this great app. Um, I, I, I think that uh, you could benefit from it, uh, you know, especially in families. Thyroid, uh, thyroid pieces have a tendency to run in families. And, uh, you know, we think that that's really uh, uh, something that a community can build. One of the exciting parts uh, of, of being able to do this in January when it's Thyroid Awareness Month is that we've we've uh, made a commitment for the uh, the group that at the end of January um, we'll collect we'll we'll combine all the anonymous quiz answers and we'll let everyone who took the quiz the, the ability to see what the most common answers from the group were so you can see how your private risk assessment compares to the group as a whole 
And the exciting part for us is that um, we're, what we find is going to actually determine um, what we what we address next. So the big conversation of thyroid is going to be determined by uh, the answers for the quizzes and the information that we collect. Uh, you know, so my uh, so if my you can find that it's you know most of the people said uh, has uh, coarse hair or dark circles or uh, weight gain or hair loss. Those are things that you're going to actually be able to now create that.